Welcome to today's program titled Return to Business, Reopening in the D.C. Metro Area, Practical Considerations to Help Ensure Employers Are Ready. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit your questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credits for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down. It will not be reread, and it is required for CLE credits. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Raymond Baldwin, Christine Constantino, and Samantha Brooks. Raymond, you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, and thanks everyone for joining us. We're, we're very happy to be speaking with you about our slow return to work, our, our slow return to some sense of normalcy. As I think everyone knows, employers have an obligation to provide a safe working environment for their employees. And beyond that, I think that it's fair to say that we have a basic obligation to one another with respect to communal health and safety. In short, we want to protect each other, our employees, and our businesses. The COVID-19 situation is evolving and, and the guidance has changed over time. It is important that businesses stay informed about the guidance and recognize that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, either by jurisdiction or by type of business. But it is clear that no matter where you are or what you do, you must know and follow the requirements for your jurisdiction, plan carefully for your reopening, and when you do start to reopen, you're going to need to screen or assess your employees and you're going to need to take reasonable and appropriate measures, reasonable and appropriate measures to ensure the actual working environment is safe uh, for everyone. We hope that this webinar helps you do those things. Sorry about that. Let me uh, go back here. So here's us. And here's our agenda for today. We're going to go through the basic reopenings plans and then provide hopefully some constructive guidance about how to make it work for your business. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sam Brooks. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm going to start by talking about the District of Columbia. Where are we now in D.C.? So the data on the screen is from June 6, but I'm going to give you the most recent data that we have on COVID in the district, which is from June 8. As of June 8, there were 85 new cases of COVID-19, 9,474 total cases of COVID-19 in the district, and there were four additional deaths for a total of 495 in the district. So I'm sure most of you are aware that uh, the stay-at-home order went into effect in the district on March 25th, 2020. And shortly thereafter, in April, the mayor formed a Reopen DC advisory group, which was tasked with preparing recommendations to reopen DC. And the group proposed a phased reopening, phases one, two, three, and four, and prepared a report for the mayor regarding its recommendations. And as you're aware, I'm sure, beginning May 29th, we went into phase one. So on May 29th, the stay at home order was lifted and we do not have an end date for the end of phase one as of now. Um, pursuant to the order uh, that was actually issued May 27th, um, the public health emergency was extended through July 24th. The order continued to prohibit gatherings of more than 10 people and continues to require social distancing of six feet between people. Uh, wearing a face covering, uh, face covering, excuse me, is encouraged and not specifically required. Um, 
the the order also uh, permitted certain non-essential retail businesses to reopen for outdoor pickup and delivery, but indoor shopping continues to be prohibited in phase one. Um, work from home arrangements are strongly recommended for all office spaces in phase one, um, and uh, barbershops and salons were permitted to reopen by appointment. To be clear, um, in phase one, non-essential businesses remain closed with the exceptions that I just mentioned. And uh, certain non-essential businesses that continue to be closed, for example, are fitness establishments, party supply stores, museums, bookstores, uh, bars and restaurants, excuse me, bars and clubs that are not permitted to serve food, things like that. Um, I will say that certain businesses have gotten created, uh, creative, certain gyms and fitness studios, though they're not permitted to operate indoors, I've seen in my own neighborhood in the district workout classes being offered in public parks that have reopened um, with social distancing protocols being observed. Um, businesses operating in phase one are required to do a few things. The first is inform employees that they should not come to work if they are sick. Inform employees of all applicable leave provisions, including uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act leave and other leaves that might be available to employees. Um, em employers are also required to create a plan regarding COVID-19, including providing employees information about testing locations in DC and different guidance uh, from the CDC. And it, it is recommended that employees wear uh, face coverings in common areas of office spaces. So if an employee is working in their office with the door closed, a mask is not necessary, but if they're walking in uh, the cafeteria or in the copy room, it is recommended that they wear a face covering. So just some specifics as particular industries. Um, in phase one, healthcare providers in DC may continue to offer or resume offering services, including out, outpatient or other surgical procedures uh, in DC, as long as they don't unduly burden the hospital capacity or COVID-19 related resources. Um, some specific details with regard to licensed food establishments operating in phase one, they are permitted to continue takeout, delivery, and grab-and-go services. Outdoor dining is permitted in phase one with certain restrictions. Uh, for example, no more than six people per table. Tep uh, tables are required to be separated by six feet, and restaurants are required to implement certain sanitation and uh, dis disinfection protocols. Um, Restaurants are also encouraged to use a reservation system to avoid crowding and lines outside of restaurants waiting to get into the outdoor dining space and farmers markets, which are licensed food establishments or allowed to expand their operations in various ways. So how do we get to phase two? This is a chart from coronavirusdc.gov that details the metrics required for a phase two reopening. And, and, and briefly and summarily, that includes 14 days of decrease in community spread, a low positivity rate in testing, uh, increased healthcare capacity, you know, which includes things like available hospital beds, available ventilators, et cetera, and implementation of contact tracing, which we have seen in, in the district. Um, I'll note that at a press conference on June 5th, which was the last press conference that we heard from the mayor and her team, um, the, the DC health director, Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt said that DC could begin phase two reopening as early as June 19th, as long as the metrics in this chart were met. And, and as of June 3rd, which, when, which is when this chart was issued, there had been a sustained decline in community spread for four days after a spike on May 30th, which was uh, widely reported in the news. And, and I'd also note that during this press conference, Dr. Nesbitt made clear that it's still not clear how the large protest gatherings that we've seen in the last week are going to impact the COVID testing rates and, and positivity rates. It, it did appear that social distancing protocols were not being observed during the protests 
that we saw, and, and it was also clear that not all protests were wearing masks or face covering during the protest. And this is certainly still developing. There has been uh, some news that the district is encouraging anyone who participated in the protest to go get tested. And also today's news was that um, some DC National Guardsmen who were at the protest have tested positive. So I think we do expect to see some surge in testing and it remains to be seen how that will affect uh, phase two reopening. But when we get to phase two, what will it look like? Um, during that same press conference I mentioned, Ma Mayor Bowser made clear that she had not drafted an order as to phase two, but that she was considering the phase two recommendations from the Reopen DC advisory group. And those recommendations include a continuing recommendation that, a recommendation that employees work from home to the extent that they are able, but with reopening office space at a 25% capacity and the implementation of social distancing protocols in the office space. Uh, we expect that phase two would allow small gatherings up to 50 people and that indoor dining at restaurants would reopening with, 50, uh, with social distancing protocols and up to 50% capacity in restaurants. However, the type of dining would be monitored. There would continue to be buffet rest, uh, no buffet restaurants and bars and nightclubs could not reopen. We would expect to see some expansion of non-essential retail operations in phase two, including in-store shopping with certain safeguards and capacity limits. For example, five people per 1,000 square feet, not to exceed a 50% capacity of any given retail space. We'd also expect to see an expansion in the availability of personal care services like salons, massage, excuse me, uh, nail salons, massage parlors, et cetera, which could open with uh, appointments only and strong safeguards and social distancing. In some jurisdictions outside the GMV, we've seen places like nail salons open with plexiglass barriers in between the manicurist and the uh, customer with limited capacity in the, um, in the uh, salons. So in phase two, there has been specific guidance issued as to restaurants and retailers in phase two. And, and while this guidance is specifically designed for restaurants and real, retailers, it certainly does apply to other industries and other office spaces as well. And the recommendations are that in phase two, businesses should create three different checklists, an operations checklist, an enforcement checklist, and a closure plan checklist. The operations checklist allows the business, the employer, to develop an operations plan for this new normal, as Ray mentioned. So this would include creating a site map with signage about various protocols that the business is going to implement, including the location of staff, spacing among customers, seating, access to bathrooms, entrances and exits, and the location of hand sanitizer or hand washing stations. In the operations checklist, it should also ensure proper sanitation protocols like single-use utensils, sanitizing food carts or pens or menus or other materials as they are used between customers or employees. It also provides for cleaning surfaces every two hours, uh, that food handlers wear masks and gloves, that, uh, that restaurants, even uh, retail businesses, operate an online reservation system and an online ordering system. Um, as I mentioned, hand sanitizer and hand washing stations, masks and gloves to be worn by retail employees, um, making sure that there are multiple ways to pay, you know, Apple Pay, credit cards, what have you, to try to minimize the exchange of cash to the extent possible. The operations checklist should also include speaking to staff to determine who is ready and willing to return um, under these conditions and to make sure that staff are advised of these new operations protocols. The enforcement checklist helps employers and businesses develop an enforcement plan. And this would include a communication strategy to inform staff and the public of the safety plans and requirements of the business. Um, it would also in, include a method for monitoring compliance with the new protocols and also proposed enforcement matter, measures if the employee or if an employee, excuse me, fails to comply. 
And, and lastly, the enforcement checklist would identify the staffing needed to address concerns of potential violations of the protocol. Um, the last checklist that uh, an employer should consider in phase two is a closure plan checklist. What would the business, restaurant, or retail location do if it has to close or operate in a modified way due to a particular health incident, incident for, for example, someone testing positive, an employee testing positive for COVID-19, or an executive order that, again, limits operations. The closure plan checklist should include proposed steps to close, ensuring compliance with any executive orders as to closure, and communications to employees and customers about m more modified operations or closures. Um, and also, um, Importantly, also, as Ray mentioned a few moments ago, that uh, businesses have someone who continues to monitor guidance from D.C. Um, at coronavirus.dc.gov, which I'll, I'll put up on the slide in a moment. So beyond phase two, what happens? And, and that looks like phase three and phase four. Though we have no real sense of when D.C. could potentially enter phase three or phase four, and in fact, phase four is when there is an effective cure or vaccine for COVID. So, so it could be a, a ways away. Um, regardless, based on the Reopen DC report, we believe that stage three would look like continuing to encourage employees to work from home um, with 50% capacity in office space, restaurants and bars reopening at either 50% or 75% uh, capacity, and personal services like salons, et cetera, would continue to be by appointment only. What's important um, in phase three or phase four, whenever we get there, is the, the continued importance of social distancing of at least six feet, regular cleaning and sanitation of office space um, or common space used by customers and employees alike, implementing protections for workers and educating employees about COVID-19. And, and as we get into phase three and phase four and even phase two, certainly businesses should consider strategies for accommodating sick employees. And, and this slide is a slide from Reopen DC and it identifies sort of the metrics and the summary of phases um, for, uh, excuse me, for the phases one through four and some of the universal safeguards that I just mentioned. So these are just a couple of resources. Coronavirus.dc.gov is the district's uh, coronavirus website. It is chock full of information for businesses and residents of DC alike. And this, the second bullet um, is a PDF and provides guidance for employers in non-healthcare settings about what to do when an employee reports that they are undergoing COVID-19 testing or have a positive COVID-19 case, which is something that I think most businesses can expect. So now I will turn it back over to Ray to talk about Maryland. Great. Thanks, Sam. I like that expression, chock full. You don't hear that much anymore. Well, good. So in, in Maryland, um, there is a roadmap to recovery that's been developed uh, in conjunction with a number of entities and organizations. And the key uh, to this plan is a gradual, gradual uh, uh, reopening and hopefully um, progress towards recovery. Uh, like many jurisdictions, Maryland is operating in uh, stages or phases. Um, the determining factor when to move from one stage to the next is a 14-day period of downward trajectory of uh, benchmark metrics uh, that include current hospitalization rates for COVID-19 and the number of daily death rates for COVID-19. And obviously, the idea is that we will not move from one uh, phase to the next. Uh, unless and until we've had 14 days of downward uh, data. The roadmap makes clear um, some key uh, benchmark principles. One is that uh, employees should expect to telework for the foreseeable future, as well as wearing face masks and practicing social distancing guidelines. Teleworking, face masks, social distancing. It also makes clear that even when reopening um, is underway, 
those who can continue to telework should continue to telework. Uh, businesses should actively support social distancing by implementing uh, uh, these policies and adopting uh, flex as well as adopting flexible leave guidelines. And um, we'll be talking a lot about face coverings. Maryland's roadmap to recovery um, repeatedly states, my mask protects you, your mask protects me. And so why am I emphasizing these bedrock principles? Uh, because at the end of the day, employers are required to take reasonable steps to provide a safe working environment. And these are some of the reasonable steps that you need to um, implement. Stage one, Maryland has already moved through stage one. Uh, we are now into uh, stage two. Essential uh, businesses, non-essential businesses rather, have been uh, reopened with some uh, restrictions. Uh, those businesses that are uh, entitled to open now, allowed to reopen, include offices, uh, things like accounting, banking, finance, insurance, uh, essentially any office environment is uh, now able to open. Maryland has asked businesses to take a voluntary back-to-business pledge. It is suggested that this pledge be signed and posted uh, both as a way to demonstrate to employees that businesses are taking proactive steps to ensure that they're safe um, and also as a way to help ensure that, that the businesses are actually taking those steps. And as you can see, it, it provides some of the key steps that each business should take. So what's happening in phase two? Well, as I mentioned, we're still staying home when we can, we're still teleworking when we can, we're wearing face coverings and practicing social distancing. Maryland is recommending that uh, businesses consider temperature checks and other screenings, uh, as well as staggering start times. Um, Maryland has provided a list of uh, specific practices for each business or type of business, and those are found at open.maryland.gov. Uh, they generally consist of a few big ticket items. One is preparing the building. In other words, making sure that you've got hand sanitizer stations ready, you've got your work areas reconfigured, you've got signage, You've got six-foot markings. You've worked with building uh, ownership and services to ensure you've done that. Next big ticket item is to prepare your employees. You're training them. You're screening them. And you're uh, implementing safe physical and social distancing practices. And, and then the third is um, ensuring that the work environment itself is safe, whether that means reconfiguring desks, placing plexiglass, it really depends on your business and um, the guidance understands that both by business and flex and jurisdiction, there may be some variance in how you do that. Face coverings. Maryland does have a requirement that um, if you're on public transportation, you have to wear a mask. If you're uh, a retail customer, you have to wear a mask, or retail staff, and then food service restaurant workers uh, have to wear masks when interacting with customers. For everybody else, face masks are recommended anytime there's going to be a face-to-face -face interaction, but not uh, simply when you're sitting in your office typing away at your um, computer. Just to give you a sense of uh, the evolving nature and to highlight the import of, of keeping abreast of the uh, guidance. Here's what the CDC now says. Note that the CDC doesn't definitively state you have to wear masks or should wear masks, although it does ultimately recommend 
and it wasn't that long ago that uh, the guidance was masks didn't help. But uh, now we know that they do. And as I said before, my mask protects you, your mask protects me, and for businesses reopening in Maryland, in any situation where you've got a face-to-face -face interaction, people should be wearing masks, and if uh, folks don't have masks, you should make every effort to ensure you provide them. So I know we're all anxious to go out and eat. Uh, in Maryland, restaurants are now reopened with certain restrictions. Uh, uh, unfortunately for all you buffet fans out there, no more buffets. Uh, my guess is you will not see those uh, for a very long time. Two jurisdictions closest to the district, Prince George's County and Montgomery County, are moving slower than the rest of the state. That's due to the number of cases. Um, here's a nice chart that Prince George's County has put together indicating uh, the businesses that are now open. Um, PG County is still in phase one, and it's even a modified phase one. Montgomery County, for its part, uh, remains in phase one as well, and there are uh, considerable restrictions which remain in place, including that retail businesses can only offer curbside pickup. Uh, I don't know if anybody's been out to uh, Target or um, Dicks, a lot of these places uh, uh, are uh, doing great work in terms of providing curbside uh, pickup. Manufacturing is open as long as appropriate steps are taken. Again, going back to the principles, look at what's required of manufacturing. Physical distancing, face coverings, uh, and cleaning, and training. That's uh, generally what everyone should be thinking about and doing. In Montgomery County, you can go get a burger outdoors, uh, but restaurants themselves are not yet open. I'll turn it over to Chrissy. Thanks, Ray. So uh, Virginia is, I guess, the trailblazer here. Um, as we talk about uh, here that yesterday the governor announced that um, Richmond and Northern Virginia would be joining the rest of the state in phase two, so sort of leading the pack here. Um, but Forward Virginia is the tagline that they've come up with to reopen. Um, it's a three-phase plan. It was enacted for most of the state on May 15th when the stay-at-home order was listed lifted, and I'm sure as everyone here knows that Richmond and Northern Virginia have been lagging a little bit behind, um, although this Friday will now be on the same playing field. Phase two for the rest of Virginia started uh, June 5th, and will start for Northern Virginia and Richmond this Friday, June 12th. Um, and then phase three, there's no anticipated target date. The Forward Virginia blueprint is what the governor comes out with in different points to show kind of the key elements of this plan. There's no, uh, like I said, no target date, but the expectation is that um, each phase would last at least two to four weeks. Given the, the um, expected uh, lifting of restrictions in phase three, this of course doesn't mean no restriction, but a significant lift that we would not expect to see that any earlier than July and potentially later. So we'll go through each phase in a little bit more detail, but the governors made clear that the executive orders which have implemented each of these phases are just setting a, quote, floor for compliance. There's certainly uh, no mandate that you reopen, and, you know, if you can't follow the guidance, you actually are not permitted to re reopen. Um, so that, that I wanted to make clear that this is not a requirement per se. Uh, the, this is a map from the Virginia Department of Health, um, and you can see here what justified the delay in Northern Virginia and Richmond having um, some additional time in each phase, given the amount of cases there. And then the uh, lower chart actually uh, looks just at the Northern Virginia region, and you can see there this chart's effective as of Monday, the trend lines that have supported moving to the next phase. Um, again, this, this um, Virginia Department of Health uh, website that provided these slides is interactive, so if you want 
more specific information about any location, and I certainly recommend it um, if that interests you. So phase one, uh, we now know, uh, we thought we were going to be in, in Northern Virginia for a little bit longer, um, but we'll only be another 48 hours or so. Um, but this is just briefly what was in place during phase one, that non-essential retail was able to operate at 50% capacity. We saw outdoor seating permitted at restaurant and beverage establishments at 50% capacity um, if you had the appropriate uh, distancing between patrons. And indoor uh, restaurants and beverage places were limited to uh, takeout and delivery only. There was also appointment-only salon services. I know this is a, an issue near and dear to many of us. Um, I also include this hotel um, note, not because it was part of phase one executive order, but noting that we have a lot of participants from the hospitality area, that essentially hotels were not specifically addressed, um, but the governor's website did make clear that what you're looking at is the restriction on the actual services. So you're looking at the my, um, excuse me, adhering to the social gathering limitations as well as the specific restrictions in place for food and beverage establishments or fitness facilities that are within the hotel um, without providing kind of guidance or requirements for a hotel generally. All other businesses are recommended to follow what they're calling guidelines for all business sectors. They make clear, and the, the bold is from their website, that these are best practices. Uh, it does say they should be followed, so I think it's a strong recommendation, um, but they've not gone so far as to make any sort of requirement per se. And the mandatory, there are mandatory requirements for uh, specific business sectors, uh, which we'll highlight in a minute. Additionally, the governor has made clear, and I quote, all other categories of businesses should utilize teleworking as much as possible. Where teleworking is not feasible, such businesses should adhere to these guidelines that I've just mentioned. Uh, Virginia did a little, um, pledge, or I guess it's an ex executive order, out of order here, um, in that the face masks were actually not required at the start of phase one, and effective May 29th, there was a new order that has required them um, in several uh, customer-facing establishments. So there's actually a, it's more restrictive in phase two with respect to face masks, which is a little bit unusual. The executive order is clear that this applies to patrons of all of the establishments that are listed here. Um, I would note that the any other indoor non-residential place shared by groups of people in close proximity is a catch-all for any sort of business that's not otherwise enumerated um, that is you know, customer facing, as you can see here with the word patron specifically. The order also requires employees of essential retail businesses to uh, wear face masks and is explicit that this is the only part of the order that applies to employees. So these other um, face mask requirements apply to the actual patrons in your business as opposed to the employees who are working in that space. There may be requirements in other executive orders, but as far as this, there was some confusion when this came out as to whether or not this applied to everyone and the order is expressed that the only portion that applies to employees uh, relates to essential retail businesses. As you can see, there are some exceptions. Again, these are talking about patrons. Um, one point for employee education, potentially, if you have a customer-facing business, is that any person who declines to wear a face covering because of a medical condition cannot be required to produce or carry medical documentation verifying the stated condition or be quite be required to identify the precise underlying medical condition. So that in and of itself doesn't apply to employees, but if you have employees that are dealing with customers on a regular basis, you may want to make clear that, that they cannot require or force uh, disclosure of any sort of condition if a customer indicates that they're unable to wear a mask. This is enforced by Virginia Department of Health. I note that because there is some concern among businesses about whether or not the business themselves are tasked with enforcing um, this with respect to its patrons. In other words, are you required to deny service to someone or permit them from, prohibit them from entering if they refuse to comply with a face mask requirement? So it is clear that that is not the business's obligation. However, a business that is, quote, grossly negligent um, in, uh, I guess, encouraging this type of um, face covering requirement 
is uh, may be cited by the Virginia Department of Health. Given the, the kind of gap that the order left with respect to employees, it also did direct that these emergency regulations and standards would be enacted um, in order to govern the actual workplace with respect to employers, uh, employees, independent contractors as well, to address specific issues and um, it, maintaining a safe work environment um, for COVID-19. This is obviously going to be a process because these regulations would have to be ap approved by the Virginia Safety and Health Codes Board before they become effective. Um, and their primary focus seems to be, of course, obviously the safety element of it, but that uh, upon approval, the Department of Labor and Industry can then uh, enforce these standards through civil penalties and business closures. So basically they're looking to put some teeth on the requirements, um, but we haven't seen a draft of those yet, nor is there an anticipated date, just something to look out for. Okay, so phase two, which is where we basically all are now, um, these are some of the kind of hallmarks um, of the phase two, which is pretty consistent across the jurisdictions here. We have seen uh, an increase in permitted uh, social gathering capacity to 50, Restaurants and beverage establishments can now offer indoor dining at 50% capacity. Fitness centers can open at 30% capacity. And there's generally speaking a still, quote, safer at home uh, mentality here, meaning teleworking is still strongly encouraged where it's feasible. The guidance here for non-essential retail and personal grooming remained essentially the same. So I'm going to show you a chart here in a second that kind of gives you a, an idea of what the changes are um, in various sectors from phase one to phase two. And yes, um, for those of you who have asked, we will be providing these slides after the presentation. So if this interests you or any of the resources, anything like that, you'll get that information. Um, but essentially here, you can see that almost everything is open now, even if it's restricted in phase two. So nowhere near normal, but most services and businesses are able to um, operate at this point. So as I mentioned, the, there is, quote, best practices for all businesses that the um, guidance says you, quote, should adhere to. And the reason I keep using the quotes is because I think that there is some um, confusion as to whether or not it is actually a mandatory requirement or obligation or if it's simply a strong recommendation. Um, at this point, you know, the plain language does indicate it is a strong recommendation. However, you know, for various reasons, the safety of employees and the continued successful operation of businesses is certainly um, something you should comply with. These best practices fall into three large buckets, uh, physical distancing, enhanced cleaning and disinfecting, and enhanced workplace safety. I'm not going to go through them um, specifically because there are things we've touched on already a little bit with Maryland and DC, but also because we're going to talk about these again um, in the second half of the presentation. I will read really quickly for you the sectors that are regulated. If you are not in one of these sectors, that means you fall into the all business sector category, and this is the guidance that you are looking at. So they have restaurants and beverage establishments, farmers markets, non-essential brick and mortar retail, fitness and exercise facilities, personal care and grooming services, campgrounds, indoor shooting ranges, public beaches, racetracks, recreational and entertainment businesses, public and private social clubs, and recreational sports. So if you do not fall into one of those categories, you are in this all business sector um, guidance. And I will point you to a checklist that um, they have developed as part of the reopening toolkit, as they say. And the checklist itself is two pages, a small print, so I haven't recreated it here, but I have provided a link to it on the resource page and would strongly recommend that you uh, look into that. It provides a lot of detail as well as um, sites to potential, for example, employee training videos and things like that, that can be used as really a step-by-step -step, um, you know, process for reopening and maintaining a safe work environment once you have, and additionally things to consider. And much of the, the guidance is consistent across states because it is derived from CDC data. Okay, because I know that, that there are a couple um, large categories or buckets where we have a lot of people operating in that space, we want to cover the requirements for uh, brick and mortar retail as well as food and beverage establishments. 
So brick and mortar retail here, you can see listed, has strict adherence to the best practices guidelines. That means what is their recommendation for everyone else is a requirement for brick and mortar retail. In addition, there are the following requirements that are listed here on this slide. For example, 50% occupancy, um, required signage at the front of any store or establishment that says that anyone with symptoms um, or known exposure to COVID-19 may not enter. Um, additional po postings regarding public health reminders, assisting customers in maintaining physical distancing. So you're talking about potentially creating barriers to spaces where people may congregate, um, posting additional signs, creating one-way aisles, things like that. There are several recommendations in the guidance as to how you can, quote, assist customers in maintaining uh, physical distancing. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about masks. There are specific cleaning and disinfecting requirements and uh, sanitization for shopping carts and baskets. In addition to these requirements, there are also additional recommendations for this industry. As I mentioned, the toolkit and checklist before uh, with respect to all businesses, I would note that there is a specific one for brick and mortar retail and also a specific one for food and beverage establishments that are part of the reopening toolkit that I would highly recommend that you look into if you're operating a business in these space in this space because there are a lot of things to keep track of and I think it would help uh, as far as an organized, organized approach, excuse me. So again, quickly with the uh, restaurant and beverage establishments, same thing uh, with required uh, best practice guideline adherence, as well as the same signage requirements about people can't enter if they have COVID or known exposure within the past 14 days. Additionally, we're at 50% capacity um, with bar areas, playground areas, gaming areas, dance floors, all of that has to remain closed. Um, with respect to social distancing, it's very clear that it's not six feet between tables, it's six feet between patrons. So if, if your tables are six feet apart, that means that you have guests that are within six feet of space, uh, with the, excuse me, within each other's um, space within a six foot circle. That means that they are too close. So you need to make sure that the, um, the distancing includes where the patrons would actually be, as opposed to just the table itself. Um, Pre-shift employee screening is required. Um, and so, you know, we'll talk a lot about screening, but um, just to note that that is something, and it, it's not necessarily employer screening, it is um, employee self-screening at home, which includes temperature checks and other um, evaluation of symptoms um, that you probably want to train and walk them through how to conduct, um, but that is required. Um, and I think one other thing I thought was of interest for businesses that, is that they have no reusable menus. So you can't simply sanitize your menu and reuse it. It either has to be paper or you could obviously use online options and things like that, but you cannot use reusable menus and you cannot fill any containers brought in by a customer. So if they bring in their own mug, you cannot use that. So those are a couple um, kind of uh, unique elements, I think, of this plan. So phase three, as I said, we don't really have a time um, target for it. But these are supposed to be the um, key elements, uh, according to the governor, is what we would expect in phase three. There is no specific or formal plan drafted, and it's not expected earlier than July. And I would note here it says safer at home for vulnerable populations. There is still a stay at home recommendation right now for vulnerable populations in phase one and phase two. So where everyone else has moved to this safer at home um, strategy, that's expected now for all populations as part of phase three. And so here are the resources that I mentioned, again, the business reopening toolkit, um, where you're gonna find these checklists, as well as uh, signage, pre-printed signage that you could use, and um, a couple other um, resources that may be of interest. So with that, I will turn it over to Sam. Thanks very much. So as we look to reopening office space in particular in different businesses across these jurisdictions, it's certainly important to have a plan. Um, the first step in the plan is to determine which employees will return to work and how and when they will return to work. So the, the business should decide when to bring employees back once the shelter in place orders are lifted in the jurisdictions where the business operates and consider will that, will that be an all at once uh, return to the office, 
or a phased or staggered return to work. Think about the amount of notice you want to provide to your employees about when they will be returning to the office or to work. And also consider any restrictions on percentage of occupancy in your particular business that, that we've discussed. It's also important to determine which employees are legally permitted to return to the work site and consider that certain employees may be prohibited from returning to the work site because of either actual COVID symptoms, isolation, or quarantine by a healthcare provider, et cetera. Another consideration, consideration is which employees will return to the work site immediately and the timing for the return for other employees. Will you bring all employees back immediately? Will that include any furloughed employees? Will you recall any employees who were laid off? And, and if it does, will that require new onboarding, new I-9 forms, things like that? Will you start with employees performing certain critical functions for your business? Another consideration is will the timing of bringing back people to business vary by the location where you operate and if you operate in multiple in one of the multiple jurisdictions that we've we've talked about today um, what about concerns that your business might have about a spike in covid related cases or the difference in the shelter in place uh, and and phased reopening plans in these various jurisdictions and how will the business needs at your different locations um, affect your reopening Another thing to consider is what about different timing for bringing folks back based on whether or not they can or cannot perform some of their work functions remotely and, and whether there's other uh, selection criteria that you might consider for bringing people back. The one thing to consider with respect to selection criteria is claims or potential claims of discrimination in the application of this selection criteria. Um, another thing to consider is staggered work schedules. Will you have some folks work in your office from 6 a.m. to noon and then noon to 6 p.m., or have someone come in only one day a week and work from home four days a week, et cetera? All of this is going to be based on your particular business needs and the circumstances that apply to your particular business. Um, regardless, one key thing to think about is which employees, if any, are on legally protected leads and also plan for the business impact of anticipated future requests for leave and and we do there's been some recent guidance on the FS, uh, CRA leave um, that people who were able to work from home successfully for the last you know weeks or months may still be entitled to protected leave if their circumstances change as businesses reopen the last thing to think about uh, with respect to this is how your business might handle high-risk employees. And the CDC has identified a list of high-risk individuals, which is available on the CDC website. And, and I'm sure you're all aware that these high-risk folks include, um, for example, those who are immunocompromised, those with asthma, HIV, liver disease, heart disease, those who are a bit older, um, and uh, among other conditions. Um, you also might want to think about handling employees who are not necessarily high risk, but who have other logistical barriers to returning to the work site, for example, child or senior care obligations, public transportation obstacles, or maybe those employees who live in jurisdictions where they're still not, the, the stay at home order is still in place, or if the employee has relocated out of state to work remotely during the pandemic. Perhaps the first thing to do is determine an organizational approach to returning to business that, of course, fits your business needs and, and what is best for your business. Perhaps designate a point person or return to work team. And, and for the core team, who would you include in it? Would you include HR, IT, facilities, health, a health and safety team, office managers, senior management, et cetera, or others who can make company-wide policy decisions. It, it's clearly important to determine an organizational approach that is right for your business and your workforce. Um, and, and to make these decisions, you could think about things like, will, do you want to bring people back as soon as possible as permitted under the law? Or do you want a slower phased, more cautious approach? What are the high priority aspects of your business that should open first? How important is it to you to have employees physically in the workplace? And that um, brings me to the next 
point is request to work remotely after your work site reopens. And I think we can expect that many employees are going to request to continue working from home after your business reopens. And of course, that is a decision that you have to make what's best for your business. And, and I'd encourage you to think about has your business's philosophy toward remote work changed since COVID-19 began? And have you seen um, people able to continue to be productive while they're working from home? And how will that affect your response to people's inquiries about continuing to work from home? Um, the other thing to, con to consider is how you're going to handle requests or reasonable accommodations for a disability under the ADA to continue working from home? Or what about those who say they want to work from home because they're afraid of contracting COVID-19? Or because they say that they have childcare obligations that are not going to be um, satisfied because, for example, summer camps are closed. So these are all the kinds of things that, that will need to go into your, your decision, your calculus on this particular issue. And I'll turn it back over to Ray. All right, thanks, Sam. Um, screening and access as you begin to reopen your business. I, I put this slide in here not because it specifically deals with screening and access, but frankly because I like it a lot. It, what it what it does for me, uh, and I hope it does for you, is it simplifies um, the vast majority of information that's out there. If you're at all like me in trying to get your arms around this, it's a bit like drinking water through a fire hose, but this is a CDC slide that contains the key points uh, uh, to keep in mind as you begin to reopen. It's easy to understand, it's clear, and it's short and to the point, so I put it in here. All right, um, employee screening. Why are we talking about employee screening? Well, one is to protect our employees, and the other reason, of course, is to protect our business. Remember, the, the goal here is reasonable uh, efforts to provide a safe working environment. Um, there are a range of options when it comes to um, screening, from a basic questionnaire to a daily assessment or certification by the employee. Um, some businesses are doing this or considering doing this certification uh, as people log in or um, record time for the day. Uh, another option is a, a sort of moving up the sliding scale is to do a visual uh, assessment um, of employees to look for signs that they may be uh, running a fever or showing signs of illness. And then the next uh, step is temperature checks. And finally, um, on the range of screening options is uh, testing uh, for coronavirus, COVID-19 itself, or uh, taking the antibody test. Important to remember with respect to actual testing, um, um, while some employers are providing it, um, it, it is not required and there's been no general recommendation by the government that employers um, conduct actual COVID-19 tests or antibody um, tests. The minimum screening um, that you should do is a basic questionnaire. Um, for example, uh, New York State has uh, required um, its employers to ask at least three questions, uh, and they're here on the slide. These are the, the basic information that um, has to be uh, ascertained uh, before uh, permitting folks to come back to work. I saw a question about asking people to sign an acknowledgement of, of rules that they're required to follow with respect to um, social distancing and, and workplace safety measures. You can uh, ask folks to uh, sign that sort of an acknowledgement. It should be part of any training that you do as you reintroduce people um, to the uh, workforce. You can also ask your employees to um, sign a document or one-time acknowledgement indicating that that uh, by coming to work, they are certifying that they are symptom-free and it's safe as far as they know for them to come to work. 
So what can you ask them in a questionnaire? Uh, the basics. Um, the, the EEOC has made clear now that uh, questionnaires like this are permissible and they do not violate ADA um, confidentiality requirements. Nevertheless, the information should be um, maintained as um, confidential. And again, uh, employers are exploring a range of options from hard copy documents to um, login screens um, to interviews in terms of how to elicit this type of information. One risk, obviously, as part of a computer login is um, whether you think you are likely to get uh, the most accurate information. Uh, in other words, do people just click through everything that comes on the screen um, in the morning? If you're going to do screening um, uh, live, it, it's it's best to do it uh, at or near entrances if you can. Obviously, that minimizes the uh, possibility that an individual comes into the workplace and spreads uh, the virus. Uh, many employers are working with their landlords or building owners to facilitate screening, though very important to remember that each employer has its own obligation to provide a safe working environment. If you do um, um, do an on-site screening where you ask folks to either uh, have their temperature taken or uh, answer a series of questions or submit a questionnaire, important to think about uh, paying for the time spent in line waiting, and also important to remember to maintain social distancing if uh, folks are going to have to queue up um, to do it. On the, the compensation for waiting time, I think most folks remember that, that a few years ago the Supreme Court said that um, going through certain security measures was not compensable time, but there's been some erosion of that uh, uh, principle, in, primarily in California, but also in a handful of other jurisdictions. So uh, you need to think very carefully about uh, compensation for any waiting time that you might impose on folks um, in getting into work. Okay, temperature screening. This is uh, kind of a, a, a hot button topic at the moment. Uh, when this all started to um, uh, develop, uh, the thinking was uh, probably not, uh, but then more and more jurisdictions began to uh, recommend it and some now even um, require it, and therefore it is, it is becoming uh, far more prevalent. It's obviously, um, permitted now by uh, the EEOC. Uh, there are a number of uh, different types of temperatures, temperature screenings that you can take. Obviously, you want to try and do the least invasive possible. Some people are asking employees to take their own temperature each day, and they're providing um, thermometers if the employees don't have them for that purpose. Others are um, um, conducting on-site temperature checks. Uh, and the general guidance is if you're going to do on-site temperature checks, you should do it with the least uh, invasive means um, possible. Interestingly, the CDC um, does not uh, directly recommend uh, taking temperatures. It does uh, indicate that it's a um, option that employers can implement if if they need to or want to. Uh, the C CDC suggests two basic approaches to taking temperatures as folks come in the workplace. One is uh, uh, to provide a barrier uh, partition as well as PPE for the individual who is doing the screening. The other is um, PPP only. If you're going to do temperatures, you want to think about um, who's going to take the temperature. Uh, are you going to hire a third-party provider, a medical professional, or are you going to train someone with the right um, um, disposition, shall we say, to be able to do this? 
Um, if you are going to have one of your employees do it, uh, you're going to want to think about uh, whether that person should receive any additional compensation for what is potentially hazardous duty pay, and you're obviously going to want to make sure that that person is properly um, protected, and uh, it would be a very good idea to have them sign uh, a document or acknowledgement um, certifying that they're going to maintain the information um, confidentially and that they're aware of and competent to perform the screening um, procedures. Best practice would be to have a no contact um, thermometer. Uh, and um, if folks uh, refuse to have their temperatures taken, in general, in general, the guidance is that you can ask them to uh, go home, although obviously it's important to figure out why they are refusing to um, have their temperatures taken. Important to remember that testing is not the answer to all the problems. There are lots of um, shortcomings in, in certainly the antibody test, um, and there are logistical hurdles with uh, the actual COVID-19 test. And of course, uh, simply because an individual has a temperature or does not mean that they have uh, COVID-19 and there could be a range of reasons why an individual's temperature is elevated. So uh, important uh, when considering taking of temperatures, like all these steps, that, that no one of these is going to um, ensure you have a safe working environment, you have to consider it as a package deal, uh, if you will. I think that's either Chrissy or Sam. Yep, that's Chrissy. Thank you. So um, now we want to talk about the work environment once you have made your plan, brought employees back to work, and, and sort of gotten them through the door. Um, how are you actually operating in the space and in, in the business? And so, you know, I'm not, we've talked about social distancing. I'm sure everyone is, you know, sick of hearing about social distancing, although it will be um, part of the vernacular for quite some time. Um, so obviously these are, you know, the kind of basics of social distancing. I think one, the important point here is to establish protocols that ensure employees within your space and the particularities of your space or office setup um, can maintain social distancing where possible. So in looking at actually establishing social distancing protocols in the office, here's some points that you want to think about um, that kind of aid that objective. Um, for example, you know, one thing is having one-way aisles or hallways, um, staircases that only go up versus staircases that only go down as far as obvious recommendations. And that would enable people to kind of maintain that space um, within the working environment. You may also, if you have um, a cubicle type setup, have plexiglass dividers if that's possible. And those would you'd want to have um, higher than when people are standing, so that you know it's actually creating a barrier where you can't have the actual six feet of space. And also think about obviously there's a, a across the board recommendation to limit in-person meetings. So you probably have conference space and other spaces like that that aren't being used. So maybe you can spread out your workforce into some of those spaces that aren't being used in order to you know, create the space that's not otherwise natural in the way that your office or uh, work environment is set up. Another way to um, create social distance is to stagger with respect to schedules. So if you stagger uh, work schedules, arrival times, and departure times, you're creating less congestion at certain things, you know, like the elevator banks or even the coffee machine. Um, essentially, that gives you an opportunity to, uh, you know, prevent that congestion where it's possible to have employees working a, a variable schedule. Um, additionally, if you're not operating at full capacity, if you schedule employees at different times, you may just have less employees in the workspace at any one period. Other options, of course, include staggering rest periods, um, and letting those employees who are able to continue to telework um, or work from home to do so in order to, again, minimize the number of employees who are actually in the office space to those that are necessary and create distance that may not otherwise already be built into the business environment. And to that point, I would say 
one unique thing Virginia had pointed out is um, asking uh, a, a recommended best practice for all business sectors was asking vulnerable employees to self-identify and then potentially um, discuss with them the option of looking at other positions, for example, stocking versus cashier, like a non-customer facing position, or looking at telework uh, for that population in general. If the employee agrees, obviously there are some barriers and some um, you know, hurdles you want to be careful with around the ADA and the ADEA in that space. So self-identification and if the employee agrees are very important, but those are the types of options that you could explore to create more space between the workforce. Um, this goes with, uh, again, just some more specific examples of limiting uh, physical, or excuse me, creating physical separation in the workplace. So for example, in common spaces, in a cafeteria, if you're still using that space, you might want to separate tables. Um, if, you, if you don't have the ability to clean and disinfect that regularly, you probably want to close the space and encourage employees to eat at their desk or workspace. Um, again, you want to have consistent signage throughout your office or workspace that reminds employees uh, of the social distancing. I think a lot of, and I'm sure we've all experienced it, you don't actually realize how much six feet is until you see those you know, dots on the floor, essentially. And so having those types of visual reminders, I think, are really helpful. Um, so you know, without cluttering up the place, a, um, you know, a, a good amount of signage is certainly recommended. And then again, with, with um, minimizing use of confined spaces for elevators, you may want to consider having a passenger limit and posting that capacity on each elevator so that you don't have people um, jam-packed in there and everyone's aware um, of what the limitation expect, ex expectations are excuse me, and are able to create physical separation within uh, the elevator. So hygiene protocols we've heard a lot about. Um, and so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I would say with respect to sanitization, if you are tasking someone within your workforce to uh, conduct this, be specific in the tasking. How often do you want the sanitization to be conducted? Um, you know, create regular intervals. Um, be very specific about the areas that you consider, you know, quote, high touch, because people may have different thoughts about what that means. And make a checklist to ensure accountability and consistency in the cleaning and sanitization. And here again are some more um, specific uh, examples of ways that you can in, you know, heighten cleaning and sanitation um, protocols within the space. I would look at, um, draw your attention to the shared office equipment. And for example, if you have an office where you use hoteling in different workspaces, you may want to consider using a reservation system for that office space. Uh, you want to make sure that you've cleaned the entire space between users. And or you may lock it to make sure that you only the person with the reservation is going in to use it that day um, and have access to it. So you don't have people, what they're used to doing, oh, this is an empty space. I'm going to pop in here and make a telephone call. And a couple people do that a day. It's an empty space, so maybe it's not getting sanitized as often, and then you potentially have a problem. So, you know, just thinking about those types of um, processes you can put in place to minimize um, overlap in office, you know, sharing office equipment, sharing telephones, keyboards, et cetera. Okay, so staffing, obviously training is going to be a big part of this and rolling this out effectively. Um, having all these plans and protocols and practices are you know, not worth anything if your employees aren't trained on them and following them. Um, and so you know, that's gonna be key. Obviously you also wanna be informing employees who are displaying COVID-like symptoms not to report to work, consider flexible emergency leave plans for people who don't, have, don't otherwise have leave available. Um, and also talk with your staff about plans for employees who get ill at work. So, you know, we're talking about different types of plans you make at the forefront. One may be, okay, if someone is ill, where do we, um, where do we self-isolate them in the business? No one else, you know, do we have additional face masks if they don't have one? Uh, who, you know, who are we going to um, call if they, do we have emergency contact information for everyone in case they are, you know, in actual, you know, real emergent uh, distress? So, you know, kind of thinking through those things in advance, 
um, will make it easier to respond quickly and seamlessly if any of these events do come up. And that the uh, COVID prevention plan, again, um, talking about, you know, thinking these things through before, you know, you, you know, on the front end, essentially, of this reopening process. And so, for example, one thing it's good to know is who would you contact at the local health department if you had questions or if you have to report um, a positive case and identifying that in advance. Another really key thing would be identifying a manager or employee who's responsible to address COVID questions or issues that come up in the workplace. And that way you can give specific training to that person to address um, and respond to those issues. And that way you're getting consistency in your response, as well as making it easy for employees to identify who they should be bringing their concerns to. So everything is getting vetted appropriately, consistently, and the business has all of the information because you know it's getting reported to you know, a single person or a few people. Um, training, where it says conduct employee training prior to restarting operations, if possible, things to think about um, with that is if you, as you develop new plans and protocols, if you have a portal, for example, or if you have an email blast, you may want to publish that in advance of employees actually coming back to work so they have an opportunity to review. Once you have employees and, and that, you know, entering the building, for example, is not something new to them and they understand the process for that. And then once you actually have the workforce back in place, you want to, again, conduct training on what the new protocols, practices, policies are around all of these issues with respect to, you know, sanitation and physical distancing and things like that so that, you know, really it becomes part of employees' habit because when they first return to work, obviously they have habits that they're going to have to break. And so consistent and regular training on that, you know, want to make it part of their new normal at work, essentially. And it's also good because I think there's a possibility where employees will say, well, nothing's happened, you know, recently, so I'm sure it's fine, and you start to ease up a little bit here and there, even though the actual you know, office policy or the business policy has not changed. So again, the regular reminders that this is what's in place, we're still operating under these procedures and things like that will be helpful in making sure that your entire workforce is you know, complying with, this, uh, with these new processes. Okay, so these are other, other safety measures. Obviously, we've talked about um, staggering office hours and shifts, and I think in general there was a um, push to limit visitors and limit business travel um, from the outset. So that is um, likely already being implemented. And this is just, again, a reminder of best practice. I know a lot of this is overlap as we move from state to state to city and, you know, to, through the different sections, but this obviously, um, you know, repetition here is important as it becomes part of our, you know, regular plan and process for, you know, conducting business. So again, you want to make sure that your employees are encouraged to self-identify if they've been exposed, if they've had a positive case, and that you are prepared to respond to that, including, you know, treating and disinfecting any work areas they were in, communications with people they've become, um, they came in contact with, and being able to, you know, aid that contact tracing uh, process. So these our highlights for what would be best practices for um, communicating with employees around potential exposure um, or positive testing. So I, before I get, sorry. No, thanks, Chrissy. Um, before I get to the last couple of slides, I just want to read the CLE code because I realize that we're pushing up against the end of our time together. The CLE code is SS, like Cypher Shaw, three five. Five nine again. Cypharth Shaw SS three five five nine. So, so what do you do when an employee, um, when you have a known employee who had COVID nineteen who's been out for COVID nineteen? There's really two two options to get the employee back to work. And the first is a symptom based uh, analysis, if you will. The employee has not had a fever for seventy two hours. Their respiratory symptoms have been improved, and if there have been at least 10 days since they first had symptoms or if they were asymptomatic since their positive test. 
And the other option is a test-based option, which of course depends on locally available testing resources, which do vary by jurisdiction. So if you're able to have an, if you have an employee who's able to get tested, um, that would include two negative tests in a row, um, in addition to improved respiratory symptoms and a no fever. And I appreciate that we are running out of time, um, but just a few final thoughts on cleaning and dis disinfecting. Obviously, as, as we've all mentioned, cleaning and disinfecting are sort of the first line of defense to keep your, your team, your employees, your staff, and even your customers health, uh, healthy and safe. So obviously have robust cleaning protocols, clean and disinfect as soon as you learn of a diagnosis, and a frequent disinfection of common surfaces, including things like staplers, copy machines, and uh, items that are frequently used. And, and as we're pushing up against our end, I'll just point out that all of these slides are going to be circulated at the end of the presentation, so you'll be able to review these at your leisure. Though, as Chrissy just mentioned, some of this is cumulative and duplicative about what we have all talked about. So I will just uh, turn it over to Ray for some final thoughts. Well, well thanks, Sam, and thanks, Chrissy. Um, I think we hit a number of questions as we were going through. Um, just a couple that we missed. Uh, one is what's considered an elevated uh, temperature. The CDC guidance is uh, 100.4 or above. Uh, another question was, um, uh, should employees be required to wear face masks at their own desks or offices? Um, and the answer to that is um, no. Face masks should be worn when employees have a likelihood of uh, personal interaction with others, whether that's meetings or going to the coffee pot or uh, uh, the bathroom or whatever. Um, important to recognize with masks that the goal of wearing the mask is so that um, others are protected. Uh, and so if the individual is sitting in his or her office um, uh, by themselves, there's no need to uh, wear a mask. Lastly, I see uh, one we missed on, uh, somebody missed the CLE code. Let me give that to you again. That's SS3559, SS3559. Again, we thank everyone for uh, spending some time today with us, and we uh, wish you all the best in staying safe and making sure your uh, working environment stays safe. Thank you very much. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending.